a block timestamp manipulation. Let's get right into this one here. Now, I know this can seem a little bit tricky, but um, really, you don't have to know too much about the blockchain to wrap your head around this one. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with what timestamps are, right? It's just the representation of a specific snapshot in time, often down to this second or even millisecond um, that it occurs here. So, um, in this case, one thing that a lot of people don't know are these block timestamps are partially manipulatable by miners, uh, people mining the uh, the token. So, traditionally, they have been used for entropy and random number generation, which is all fine and well, but you don't want to use it if you're generating uh, a random number that is going to be really needed to be secret, a really true random, right? If you need something true random um, for like a reward or something like that, you don't want this to be based off of the block timestamp because of, like I said, it's manipulatable. Um, and we'll see an example of that, of course. So let's get into it here, the vulnerability. Block.timestamp or it's alias now. So when we're looking at the code, just know that if you see the word, the keyword now, that's just a shorthand for block.timestamp. They're the same thing, essentially. Uh, but they can be nip, uh, manipulated by miners if they have some incentive to do so. So in this one, you have a simple game called roulette, not soul. In a contract roulette, we are initializing a public unsigned integer pass block time because we want to force one bet per block. And we have a constructor here uh, for payable to initially fund the contract. And this is the fallback function where you make the bet. So it is uh, payable. And uh, let's see, we're going to require that they send 10 ether in order to play. And here's where we're doing the uh, block, uh, block dot timestamp. Yep. And we're going to check that the timestamp is not equal to the past block time. Because remember, we only are going to allow one transaction per block. And the pass block time will be set to the current time. And so if the current timestamp uh, modulus 15 is equal to zero, then they win in this case. So, and if they win, then we'll do a message.sender transfer this dot balance. So basically this is like a lottery, a simple lottery. Um, with all the conditions that I outlined. So basically you would assume that everything would be distributed evenly, right? And so in that case, you would have a 1 in 15 chance of winning the lottery uh, for this contract, right? And getting the payout. But miners, as we know, can adjust the timestamp uh, should they need to. So in the, in the case of this or something like this, right? If enough ether is pulled in the contract, a miner solves a block is incentivized to choose a timestamp such that block dot timestamp or now module fifteen is zero, so they could just do that and then win the ether <laughs> in the uh, block reward, right? Um, there's only one person allowed to bet per block, so you can also front run these attacks too, which is something that we saw in the previous video in this series. Check that out uh, if you haven't. I'll link it at the end of the video. Um, but yeah, in practice, block timestamps are monotonically increasing, and so miners cannot choose arbitrary block timestamps. They must be larger than their predecessors. So they are limited to setting block times not far in the future as these blocks will likely be rejected by the network, and then nodes will not validate blocks whose timestamps are in the future. So that's something to note here. But how do we actually prevent against this attack? So, well, the biggest way is to simply not use this for entropy. You're generating random numbers that are the deciding factor of something, right? If you just need to, if you just need to generate a random number and it doesn't really matter, or there's no incentive for a miner to manipulate the timestamp to get any kind of benefit. You just need it for some, something in your code. And yeah, sure. Go ahead and base it off the timestamp if you want to. But in cases like this, where it obviously is very important, um, that uh, that a miner is not able just to win it at will, win a lottery uh, at will, <laughs> you definitely want to not use the block timestamp for that, right? So time-sensitive logic is sometimes required, unlocking contracts, time-locking. 
So completing an ICO after a few weeks or enforcing expiry dates is sometimes recommended to use block.number. So that's another thing that you can use. We look at the Solidity Docs to see block.number um, is the current block number. And the block number is a little bit more difficult to manipulate for the miners. Um, and they say average block time to estimate times, i.e. one week with a 10 second block time equates to approximately 60,480 uh, 60, blocks. So thus specifying a block number at which to change a contract state can be more secure as miners are unable to manip manipulate the uh, block number as easily. And so the basic attention token ICO contract uh, employed this strategy. So that is another alternative that you have available to you using uh, block.number instead where applicable. And uh, so this can be unnecessary if the contracts aren't particularly concerned with minor. Man yeah, like I said, if, if you're not con particularly concerned with uh, minor manipulation of the block timestamp, like if it's not a very crucial function that you're using it for, then, you know, by all means, it doesn't really matter. So this is more of like a, hey, just don't use this in the wrong context type of thing. Use this where it makes sense to use it and where you really need it to be true random don't rely on this being true random because it's not true random. Like that's the TLDR, I would say. Uh, and to look at the real world example, once again, governmental. I mean, this was an old Ponzi scheme. So you got to imagine, yeah, it was probably vulnerable to a lot of stuff. Um, so like we heard about earlier, it accumulated quite a large amount of ether in the contract. That's pretty funny though. Looking back here, just a quick aside, you had to send 10 ether to play. That probably wasn't that much back then, but nowadays that's a pretty... Uh, significant amount. So those guys that were uh, cheating the system, abusing these vulnerabilities, they probably <laughs> made a good amount off of that. If they if they hodled, though, they probably didn't hodl, so they probably spent it all. But uh, it was also vulnerable to timestamp-based attack. Uh, the contract paid out to the player who was the last player to join. So for at least one minute in a round. So here here's a pretty cr uh, creative example of how uh, hackers use the modification, like the miners use modification of the timestamp to their advantage. So uh, a miner who was a player could adjust the timestamp to a future time and make it look like a minute had elapsed. So yeah, you already see where this is going, right? So to make it appear the player was the last to join for over a minute, even though this is not true in reality, right? And then they got an extra blog post here. I won't go too far into it. Um, wait, that is not what I clicked on, is it? Oh, is this like, why is it talking about Libra? What's going on here? What is it talk? I, I feel like I've been rugged. I feel like I've been scammed. This is just a Libra commercial. They're not even doing Libra anymore, right? This is an old article, I think. Um, I think it's going to be called something else, if I'm not mistaken. I, I can't even remember what they're, what they're calling the, the coin. But uh, yeah, that's definitely not what uh, it appeared to be. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's where it takes me. Well, <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, we'll just we'll just stop it there in this in this case, and then uh, next week we will go to constructors with care. So, hey, constructors are very popular coding scheme, so um, it should definitely be pretty interesting because I, I honestly have no idea what that entails. What we'll to see? So, hopefully, this video was of help to you, uh, and if so, hit the subscribe button and like as well. And I will see you guys over in the videos on screen right now. Uh, cryptocurrency and security if you want to get caught up on this series. And we have a whole slew of, uh, what, 11 other uh, smart contract vulnerabilities that I've covered up until this point in this similar format here. So, yeah, go check those out if you haven't already. I'll see you right over in those videos. Thanks for watching.